Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar on Veggie Compass, a tool for whole farm profit management by Erin Silva and Rebecca Claypool of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers. Erin Silva is an organic production scientist and the associate director of the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She conducts research and outreach on topics such as variety adaptation for organic systems, no-till production, cover crops, and whole farm management. Rebecca Claypool is a research specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a small-scale vegetable grower. She received her master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in agroecology and studied cost of production for diversified fresh market vegetable growers through the development of the Veggie Compass tool. So now I'm going to hand over the screen controls to our first speaker, Erin Silva. Thank you, and good morning and afternoon to everybody. Uh, during today's webinar, Rebecca and I are going to discuss a whole farm management tool that we have been developing at the University of Wisconsin. The tool is called Veggie Compass and has been designed to help diversified vegetable growers with whole farm profit management. The first half of the talk, I'll be setting uh, down some general information as to the theory behind the tool and some of the thought process that goes behind it. And then during the second half of the presentation, Rebecca is going to get more into the nuts and bolts of the actual tool and how farmers have been using it on their own farms. Diversified vegetable growers, both organic and conventional, are faced with a particularly difficult situation with respect to how to best determine prices for their products that will lead to the development and maintenance of a profitable farming operation. Diversified vegetable farms are selling multiple products. Here in Wisconsin, it is not uncommon for these farms to be selling 20 to even 40 different vegetables, flowers, and herbs over the course of the season. In addition, the diversity of to the diversity of these products, these growers are often selling into multiple markets. These vegetable growers can market into CSAs, farmers markets, institutions such as hospitals and schools, restaurants, as well as to wholesale distributors. And each of these specific market channels, in each of these specific market channels, the range of prices can vary. For instance, depending on competition or what time of day it is, a grower may change what price they're asking for for a specific product at the market. Furthermore, the cost of transferring the products to the customer can vary per market channel. For instance, transfer costs to the consumer might be less for a CSA, where the CSA customers come to the farm to pick up the produce, versus bringing the produce to a distant farmer's market, to an urban center, or to uh, an institution that might be quite a distance from the farm. This variation creates a great difficulty for a farmer to be able to assess which crops are profitable, which markets are profitable, and even more specifically, does the profitability of a specific crop change depending on what market channel it's being sold into. So farmers adopt varying approaches to setting prices. Sometimes they can set prices based on competition. For instance, just taking a survey of what other CSAs in their area are charging for a share and kind of basing up and down depending on um, what their neighbors are pricing. More appropriately, maybe, growers are setting prices to a point which they're making a profit. But sometimes they're setting this profit-based price on more of an innate sense of what's being profitable versus any hard and fast numbers. Alternately, sometimes growers are basing prices on customers, and this is especially true at a farmer's market, where some vendors might choose to price low to have the customers move the product quickly for their stands, whereas other farmer's market vendors might purposely set their price so that uh, it's high enough that that uh, flow might be consistent throughout the market. And for instance, one farmer's market producer believes that if you don't have a percentage of your potential customers walk away from your table, then your price is too low. 
However, this pricing strategy is dangerous as it really doesn't reflect the cost of producing that product. All of these are based on either an innate sense or a sense of what your neighbors are pricing at, and we don't know if they're making a profit. Cost-based pricing is a method that better ensures that your products are being sold at a profit. Essentially, in this method, costs are determined for each crop to determine the minimum price that would be needed to um, in, would be needed to be gained in order to sell the product for a profit. Thus, to successfully implement this strategy, a diversified vegetable grower would need to know their cost of production for each crop that they are growing. And this can vary quite a bit. For instance, some crops, such as cabbages perhaps, for instance, these are fairly easy to grow and to harvest. It's a, generally a, a one-time harvest. Uh, they are transplanted, so they establish pretty quickly. Um, and they, these would cost significantly less to grow than a more intensive crop, such as tomatoes, that would need to be trellised and they would need to be harvested throughout the growing season. Complicating this further is the fact that diversified vegetable growers, um, these for diversified vegetable growers, these calculations then de uh, vary depending on market channel. So the overall cost of production just in the field can vary, but also the cost of production in a sense can vary depending on the market channel because certain market channels have unique costs. For instance, a CSA can incur extra costs related to outreach to its members, um, costs that may be associated with printing and developing uh, newsletters perhaps costs associated with other aspects related to marketing of the CSA, be it maybe field days, other promotional items, um, distribution boxes specific for the CSA. So even the marketing channel can change. And for instance, alternatively, a farmer's market channel could have additional transportation costs or perhaps costs associated with paying someone to be at that market stand on market day. So the budgets must include all these factors, not only the cost of production, which includes both in-season production factors in the field as well as harvests, but also other transaction costs, which can include post-harvest handling, marketing, and other uh, market channel specific costs that are required to move the product from the farmer to the customer. So where are our costs during the production season? These costs can include various items. They can include um, inputs such as uh, seed for the crops that we're growing, fertility inputs, materials for starts, tracing materials. And these tend to be costs that are incurred at the beginning of the growing season before the production in the field actually begins in earnest. These tend to be a relatively small proportion of the total cost of production, however. Wages to employees um, actually cover a, a great bulk of the cost of producing the crop. So this can include office labor, record keepers, marketing people, etc., as well as field labor, the people that you're employing to go out and do the care of the crop through the production season, weeding, harvesting, trellising, etc. The relative amount of field labor apportioned to any one crop can vary. So this is not even across all our different crops that we're growing with on, on, on our farm. Uh, for instance, carrots on a particular system may eat up a lot more field labor than broccoli because carrots require so much weeding early in the season before those tops get established. Or Related to our, our previous example, tomatoes can require quite a bit more labor than lettuce perhaps due to the time needed for trellising that crop and the extended period of harvest for those tomatoes. I can speak for at least here in Wisconsin that interest to lenders and land rent aren't as a significant cost for many growers as most of the growers own their land and are self-financed, but these could be costs that would be considered as well. And finally, a grower needs to consider their own income as well. You want to pay yourself a salary as well as to pay your employees a salary. So these items can be categorized as variable or fixed costs. And variable costs will incur basically if a crop is produced. So these variable crops would be things that we 
incur as a cost if we decide to produce a specific crop, such as seed, fuel needed to transplant or cultivate a specific crop, etc. We also can then look at fixed costs, which occur if production occurs or not. So this would be stuff like depreciation on existing tractors or building or the like, more infrastructure involved with the farm in general. I, I think I went one too far, Alice. I don't know if we can switch back. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you okay. should be able to switch back. I so got just it. Use okay. the arrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I see where okay. that is now. Okay. I'm not sure how that. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> so essentially, then going back into this more academic discussion of costs, which I'll get beyond in a in a minute here, just to set the stage. Our total costs are essentially some of the variable costs and the uh, fixed costs. So essentially, to achieve cost-based accounting, we're looking for where we're looking for our break-even price. So this price is going to uh, this break-even price is going to occur when our revenue, the money coming into the operation, equals our total cost. And this establishes essentially a floor, a minimum price that needs to be obtained um, for that product to, at the very least, not to lose money for the farm to at least cover the cost of production, post-harvest, and marketing, as well as covering the fixed costs that are apportioned to that particular product. So as we have been discussing, where are these farm expenses? Well, they lie in overhead costs, which tend to be fixed expenses, but not always. Inputs such as seed, fertilizer, etc. Labor, and again, this labor can include both field and office labor and marketing. And again, these will differ for both crop and per market channel. So again, on a diversified vegetable farm where we're looking at 20 to 40 different crops, anywhere from one to four different market channels, this is very, very complex. So these following two slides look at some data that was collected regarding cost of production from a farm in New York. And on this first slide, which is looking at cost allocation, you can see that the portion of expenses that are allocated for specific crops differ. So here, for instance, looking at the overhead costs, uh, the, the bottom part of those bar charts, um, looking at overhead costs, inputs, labor, and marketing, you can see that for these two crops, the inputs are actually a relatively small portion of the total cost. So looking actually at that section right above that bottom overhead section. That's actually, a, when you're looking at the total cost allocation, the inputs, the year's cost of seed, fertilizer, et cetera, is actually really relatively small. When we look at labor, on the other hand, we can see here that labor tends to be responsible for a significant portion of the cost required to produce that crop. And you can also see, not only does this differ between the two crops shown here, but it also differs from year to year. And this can be for various factors. Perhaps the, the weather caused conditions that made um, extra field work that year, um, maybe um, the skill of the crew, et cetera. So there is an, an added layer of variation here. Um, sorry, but I'm not sure my mouse is being extra sensitive. And I apologize. Um, on the next slide, looking at labor allocation. Um, we're looking from that same farm from a study in New York by Stoner in 2005. You can see here that field preparation and cleanup accounts for a relatively small portion of the labor required to produce that crop. And conversely, harvesting and packing take a great deal of the overall labor requirement. And again, this tends to be true across the board for all crops and all farms. So not only is it important to consider your labor needs for in-field, but considering your labor needs for harvesting and packing is, is really essential. So as perhaps is evident at this point in the talk, in order to be successful with cost-based pricing, good record keeping is essential. And it's not a minor endeavor when we're looking for the, the array of crops that a diversified vegetable grower grows in those multiple markets. 
the University of Wisconsin, the team, Rebecca and I, recently completed a survey of organic vegetable farmers to learn more about their current level of record keeping and cost accounting practices, as well as how their overall sense of quality of life satisfaction and their satisfaction with uh, profitability. And we're still analyzing this data, but one of the early conclusions that have come back from this, this survey is that the farms that are satisfied with their current record keeping system are significantly more satisfied or ranking themselves as very satisfied with their profitability. So it seems that record keeping is linked with the subset of growers of that we're, we surveyed, which was all the organic vegetable farmers across Wisconsin, that good record keeping was linked to satisfaction with profitability. So in order to assist farmers with the level of record keeping needed to be successful with cost-based pricing, UW embarked upon the creation of this tool, Veggie Compass. This project started, hard to believe for us now, about six years ago with Jim Munch. And Jim is an organic beef farmer from Wisconsin. And although an organic beef farmer, he had been working with a, a large uh, organic vegetable grower in Wisconsin to develop a to assist with determining the cost of production for specific crops and specific market channels. This grower um, that he'd been working with was very savvy in terms of business planning and was concerned that he was losing money in specific crops and certain marketing channels. And Jim, having an accounting background, they were a great team with the business savvy and the accounting skills to develop this spreadsheet. The spreadsheet, however, although the farmer that helped develop it had great results, was unwieldy and not really user friendly. There were cells that needed to be locked. It was um, a very, to try to output on it was um, uh, quite hard to visually look at. So Jim came to UW for assistance to make this spreadsheet more user friendly. So from there, UW started a partnership with Jim, myself as an organic scientist, uh, Paul Mitchell, who's an ag economist here at UW, John Hendrickson, who's an outreach specialist working with diversified vegetable farms. We brought Rebecca onto the project as a master's student. And we began to discuss with the committee of farmers their limitations to farm business planning and incorporate their suggestions as to how to improve the spreadsheet. So this was very farmer driven, very farmer based. One thing that became clear early on was that we needed to develop a system for growers to better compile their labor sales and yield data throughout the season. Some of the um, fixed costs that Rebecca will go through were easy for the farmers to get from tax forms, from invoices, etc. But they didn't really have a good method to look specifically at collecting labor and yield data as well as sometimes sales data for specific crops and specific market channels. So in 2008, we developed two kinds of labor forms that Rebecca will show to help growers track their labor costs for various crops throughout the season. From 2009 to 2012, the project team gathered farm labor data forms from 10 farms with funds provided from the USDA Risk Management Agency as well as a series trust. And this helped the team identify roadblocks and issues with the, collect, with the collection of this data to the level that was needed to successfully use the spreadsheet. And during this time as well, we had worked with two farms that undertook the task of extensively beta testing the Veggie Compass system. So they collected data, they fed data into the spreadsheet to obtain results, and then we were able to discuss with them the analysis of those results. During this time, we've also developed a website that houses a free download of Veggie Compass, so www.veggiecompass.com. And I have to admit, we are doing some overhauling of the spreadsheet as well as some rehousing of the spreadsheet. We're moving servers. So it doesn't work out great with the time of this uh, webinar, but this is the URL. There is a, um, a link where you can download this Excel-based program onto your computer for free. But um, if, if the site isn't active right now, it should be online in the next couple of weeks, and we'll have our contact information at the end. Um, but the, there is a, the website will also house some materials that will help you walk through the use of the spreadsheet. 
So with there, Alice, I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca to talk more about the details of using the spreadsheet um, so I can pass control on to her. Um, what is it? Compass. And Erin has kind of gone over some of it, but I'll just give a little bit of an overview. It is a financial spreadsheet, and it's intended for diversified fresh market vegetable growers. Um, it organizes all of your sales and cost data, and it generates your cost of production for each crop and the profitability of each market channel. As Erin mentioned, it's an Excel spreadsheet, um, so it's Excel-based. We wanted to do that so that it was accessible to many people. The goals of the spreadsheet are for individuals, farmers, to better understand their cost of production so they can improve their overall farm management and planning. And this places them in a better position to make um, decisions that strengthen their risk management capabilities. So the spreadsheet is organized in three input pages and then three output pages. Um, the three input pages, the first page is where you'll put all of your expenses. The second page, all of your sales are entered. And then the third page, you put in your labor. The output pages then show your cost of production by crop, your sales by crop, and your profit and loss by market, profit and loss by market channel. So in addition to adding in your expenses and your sales, there are a few other details that a user will need in order to use the spreadsheet. And that's um, the growing area of each crop, um, any crop specific expenses, uh, the number of transplants that you start in the greenhouse, as well as um, some details about your crop specific labor. And as a result, the spreadsheet will tell you your cost of a crop up to harvest, as well as the cost of a crop through harvest and packing. You'll find out how much um, a crop costs, so it's cost per pound or per unit. You'll get break-even prices for each market channel and each crop within those market channels, your total labor costs of each crop, and then your gross margin by market channel. So Erin mentioned that we've been working with a bunch of farms in order to, to gather this labor data. When we were interviewing um, and meeting with farms early on in this project, that seemed to be the area where growers were most stuck in order in, in getting gathering the information needed for the spreadsheet. And so we created two types of forms you can see here, um, a long form, which is the full-paged one, and then the short form, which is the smaller one. They both capture the same information but just in different ways. The long form is intended to be used by each person on your farm, and you fill out one sheet each day. So that's this form here. So you'd fill in your name, your date, and then you'll end up filling out this form, whereas the, the short form is intended to be used on an activity basis. So you may fill out one to two of these forms a day or 22 to 40, just depending on how many times you're changing activities. So for both of them, you, you would just enter in your farm name at the top and the date. And then we've divided up your, your labor in a few different categories. Greenhouse labor, as you see on the long form, is at the top, and there's a box next to it. And we don't require growers to gather um, or to divide out their labor, their greenhouse labor hours by crop. Um, we just decided that when you go in and water the greenhouse and you spend 15 minutes doing it, but you're watering 45 different crops, we didn't want people to have to break that down. So you don't have to keep track of um, the crop-specific hours within the greenhouse. So this is where your transplants are started. But we did want people to keep a, an ongoing tally. So whenever you do do any labor in the greenhouse, that value would get entered here. On the short form, it gets entered right over here in the, in the bottom part of the form where it says not crop specific activity, greenhouse hours, it gets entered there. Then for all of your other crop specific work, there's two different categories that we've broken it down into, field growing hours and harvest and packing hours. So whenever you're in the field, this would be, include planting, seeding, weeding, trellising, um, cultivating, all that type of activity is a considered a field growing activity. And that those hours would get logged to whatever crop you are working on. So if you were um, if you were weeding the broccoli, you would put that time in right in the, the in that row. Similarly, you do the same for the harvest and packing in long form. So as you're harvesting and um, 
washing and boxing up and getting a crop ready for market or to be sold, that time would be recorded as crop specific. So that value would go in whatever row it is, what crop you're using. Both forms have the ability to add in crops that aren't listed on it at the others, down at the bottom of the long form, and it's right over here at the end of that matrix on the uh, short form. The short form you fill out a little differently. Once you've decided if you're doing a field growing or a harvest and packing task, you just circle it, and then you circle the crop that you were just working on, and you enter the amount of time you were working on in the box right here. Um, additionally, there is time that you spend field growing and harvest and packing that's fairly difficult to, to assign to one crop, and we call that not crop specific. And the first line on the long form is your not crop specific line, and that's where you would put to that, that those hours. So that, for instance, would be if you're at the, in the fall, um, you spent like an entire afternoon cover cropping, but you don't know exactly what crops are going to follow in that area, that time would just be considered uh, field growing, not crop specific, and you would enter that, that time right in here. Similarly for harvest and packing, um, at the end of a harvest day, you might spend you know, 30 to minutes to an hour cleaning up, washing up the wash stand and um, crates and everything like that. But lots of crops went through the wash stand that day, and so instead of breaking that time up, you can just put that in right here as harvest and packing hours. It's not crop specific. On the short form, it's right over on the bottom half of the form below the greenhouse. So it's in the not crop specific area, and you can just fill them in in those boxes. So that's how we use the forms, and this is what we've given to, to a, a fair amount of farms that are participating in our project, and they fill them out through the year and then mail them back to me, and then we compile all of those totals and send them a summary form of what all of their um, total hours were for beans, field growing, and then harvest and packing. Um, and we're doing that one more year this year, 2012 growing season, and so if people are interested in participating in that, that's something you can get in touch with me as well about. So now I'm going to go into the spreadsheet. Um, this is, like I said, it's desi designed um, in th it's six total sheets, and the first three are your input sheets. You can see down in the tabs at the bottom that the first three is step one, step two, and step three. And um, these are just screenshots, so I can't scroll around in them, but you can get an idea of what it looks like. And step one is your expense um, input sh sheet, and this is where you're going to put all of your expenses for the farm. The expense column over here is customizable. Mostly, there are some areas like the labor and wages section that is not customizable. It's um, permanent. But many of these um, accounts are, are just a sample accounts up here, and you can fill in whatever works best for your farm business. So that would be the first thing to do is fill that in with your chart of accounts. And this is similar to a Schedule F. You all just Make your chart of accounts, put your totals in this white column, the total costs of the expenses associated with each account. What makes it a little different then is all of these column headings on the top are the different activities of the farm business. And I think of it as, you know, the, the general management and repair and maintenance is kind of more of your overhead. The blue columns over here are more of your field production or your production part of the farm. And then you have your market channels where you're selling your produce over in the colored columns to the right. And so what you're going to do is you're going to enter your values into the total cost column. And you have to think about how that expense gets distributed over the entire business. Um, some things won't go everywhere. So for instance, um, your market truck, uh, the maintenance and repair of your market truck, whatever that total expense is, will probably end up in your farmer's market column right over here. If you also use the market truck to deliver CSA boxes, then maybe the CSA market channel should carry some of those expenses as well. So the idea is that whatever the total is in a specific account, that it gets distributed over the farm how you best see fit for your business. The next slide is, at the, is a screenshot of the bottom of the first input page. And the last thing that you have to do after you've distributed all of your expenses over the farm is to think about this one column right here, the repair and maintenance of buildings and machines. The spreadsheet requires that that gets then allocated over the business once again. 
um, and you can do that just by typing in the percentage um, that you want the other parts of the farm to carry that total value. So in those, those blue numbers are all you have to put in the percentage. So when I think about this, it's if you know you had um, a big tractor repair that year and you used that tractor in the field, then field growing potentially would be where you would want to, to house most of that value. And right now it's at 70% as an example. So that's your first page for the, uh, the, the spreadsheet. And all of this data is pretty straightforward where it can come from receipts and invoices and checkbooks and bank statements or other um, accounting systems that you have, such as QuickBooks. The next input sheet is your uh, sales input sheet. So this is where you'll pick your crop, and then you'll pick the unit associated with that crop. And that will automatically populate the other um, sheets of the spreadsheet. So once you do it here, you won't have to do it again. Um, and the market channels that you have chosen on the first page will also flow over, except CSA is, is permanent. That one doesn't change. So if you don't do CSA, you can just leave these areas blank. Um, and right away, I'm just going to slip, go to the next slide, because if you scroll over to the right, there's this yellow income box. And the first thing I would do after you pick all of your crops and the unit associated with that crop, um, whether it's pounds or bunches, then you're going to go over to the shallow box and put in um, the, your total income for the items marked in red. So whether that's CSA, buy, resale, and any other income. Then you can go back to your actual market channels and enter in how much you sold of each crop and the total units you sold of each crop within each market channel. On the website, we have some um, weekly sales sheets that help keep track of this throughout the growing season so that you don't have to um, scramble so much at the end of the season that you can be using these sheets throughout and then just add up how, however many sheets you needed, whether your growing season is 24 or 25 weeks. Um, add those values up in order to get the information to this so it helps people stay on track for using the spreadsheet. Um, the next slide is going to be your, the last input sheet, which is this is where the labor comes into, into account. Um, so your crop and your unit measure will automatically overflow. And then the first thing I would do is put in your seed costs associated with each crop. And if it's a crop that you transplant, you'll want to put in the number of transplants that you started in the greenhouse. Once you've done that, then you'll have to enter in how much of each crop uh, crop grow. And this can be recorded, as you can see in the little pull-down menu, in acres, row feet, or square feet. But once you've chosen it once, that's how you'll have to measure all the crops that you're, you're growing and tracking on your farm. Then if you go to the field growing and harvest and packing columns, this is where you'll enter those totals from those labor forms that I showed, showed earlier. So in the field growing column, you would add in right in this column all of your total field growing hours for each crop, and same here, right over here with the harvest and packing. Additionally, on this page, we've allowed people to enter specific field growing expenses associated with crops. So this is a non-labor expense, and it's something like if you're growing tomatoes and you use tomato cages that you purchase, you could put that expense right on the tomato line. That's a field growing non-labor crop specific expense. And that way it has that crop reflects more accurately the field growing costs associated with it. We also do this for the harvested packing. So for example, um, cherry tomatoes, perhaps you buy uh, plastic clamshells and you only use them for cherry tomatoes. That entire expense can be put in here on the, the cherry tomato line and that will more accurately reflect how much it costs you through harvest and packing of your cherry tomatoes. The last thing on this page is right over here, these blue boxes. This is where all of that not crop specific work goes and the greenhouse work. So we talked about just keeping a total greenhouse labor hours, and that would go in the top blue box. And then your not crop specific field growing hours and your not crop specific harvest and packing hours. The yellow box is a calculated number that the spreadsheet does and that um, calculates what your actual cost of um, per hour is. So this wouldn't be your actual pay rate that you're paying people because it includes other employee benefits such as um, housing or food and taxes in this number as well. 
but it gives a grower or a user um, a good basis for understanding what your actual labor costs per hour are. So that is the last step in terms of what a user would enter. And the next three pages are all output pages. The first one is your cost of production. Um, your crop list would automatically flow over from here. And it's broken down into your seed, greenhouse, field growing, and harvest and packing. And it calculates the crop share, which in each of those sections, of total cost. So the first is seed cost, so any seed cost associated with the crop. And then the greenhouse expenses get associated in with each crop. And then the field growing expenses get added in to each crop. And so you can see there's an A, B, and C. So, so far those have all been kept separate. And then right here in this column, the total cost up to harvest is what you can find out what your investment is in each crop up to harvest. Just a reminder, this is only um, your production labor. So this is just labor that we've been tracking that is producing the crop. So this isn't um, administrative labor or selling labor. Some people at farmer's markets right now, we're just dealing with the, the field growing and harvest packing labor. After this, then you get into the harvest and packing section. And in this section is where all of your expenses and labor of harvest and packing get contributed to each crop. And then right over here at the second to last column, your A plus B plus C plus D is all of those different four different components of, field, of um, production get added up together to give you the total crop cost. And then we've divided it down to let you know what your crop cost per unit is, so however you're measuring each crop. The next output page is your sales output. And that page shows you your profitability within your different market channels. So everything in yellow will flow over. And these all three of these last pages are um, output pages. So none of this is where you'll put any input data. This will all be already calculated and filled out. So you can't change anything in these pages directly. Everything gets pa uh, changed prior in your input uh, sheets. And this is going to show you then what your sales are and how much you've sold within each of your market channels. Um, and your gross margin, and this is where you'll get your break-even price for each crop within each market channel. And I think the next slide, um, this, is, this is kind of a long spreadsheet page, so um, the next slide I think will show it to you all, yeah. So it'll show all of your market channels for you, um, and it's a, it's a little big to look at. Um, but each column colored column has a break-even price section so you can know what your price you would need to charge in order to reach that floor uh, that Aaron was talking about within each market channel because your market channels have different expenses associated with them and you assign those expenses on the first sheet. The last output page is your output, your profit and loss by market channel. And so this just flows over all of your sales and expenses and calculates your gross profit and brings in your market channel expenses and then your overhead expenses to give you your total operating income. And so that is pretty much everything that the spreadsheet does for you. And just to kind of go over that, um, the spreadsheet's going to track your cost of production by market channel, and really what it can help do is show farmers what their pricing is within their different market channels that they're growing in. You can compare crop profitability. Some crops are going to be better suited for different market channels. So it can help growers really with those decisions that impact profitability, which is what crops to grow, how much I should grow of each crop, and which market channel are they best suited as well as bigger decisions about whether you should be um, expanding the business, buying or renting more land, um, whether you should be mechanizing an aspect of your business or not. It helps growers really uh, identify those efficiencies and inefficiencies on their farm um, to, to make more uh, informed financial decisions. So by knowing this information, we can make those decisions um, that I just kind of chatted about.
So the main take-home message is that Veggie Compass is a tool that provides diversified vegetable farms with the knowledge to perform cost-based pricing. So this will tell you what your true cost, your actual costs are in order to set prices that will help you achieve a profit. Um, so there are additional materials available on the website, um, veggiecompass.com. The spreadsheet is there as well as the user manual that's been created to help walk people through entering the information needed to fill out the spreadsheet. There's also the labor forms that I showed there that are available as well as some management forms and this is just an example of a weekly sales report that I mentioned. There's also a CSA box chart as well as a farmer's market chart to help growers track their sales throughout the season. And I think that is everything. Thank you. Okay, well thank you very much. Um, we can move on to the questions. Um, and um, for anybody who joined us a little bit later in the presentation, um, you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and hit return. We've already got several questions coming in. Um, if you don't see the question box, you can just click the small plus sign next to the word question to open it up. Um, before we start, which we will do in a very short time, I just wanted to let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the eExtension website under upcoming and archived webinars. And if after the webinar you didn't get your question about Veggie Compass answered, um, Rebecca has provided her contact information here. And um, you can contact Rebecca and Erin. Um, if you have a general question about organic farming, you're welcome to use the online Ask an Expert system at extension.org slash ask. I'll be showing that link in a moment. Um, you can also find our other upcoming and recorded webinars um, at the link which will appear on your screen. Here we go. Finally, we really value your feedback, so we'd very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. So now let's move on to the question. Um, here's one. Can Veggie Compass be filled in online, for example, uploaded to Google Docs so that different people can enter their time directly into a shared spreadsheet in real time? Uh, currently, that's not how it's set up. It's set up as an Excel spreadsheet that you download. But um, I was just emailing with someone, and, and looking into the Google Docs is something that I think I'll look into to see if there's a way to, to make it work that way. But currently, no. OK. Um, can I recommend to my students that they use this instead of purchasing QuickBooks to track business enterprises? I think that the spreadsheet works well in combination with QuickBooks. I think there's a lot of things that QuickBooks can do that the spreadsheet can't do. Um, I would say if it's a someone who's just starting out on a business venture and maybe doesn't want to put down um, the investment in QuickBooks and it also takes a little bit of time to figure out how to use it appropriately, that this could be a starting place. But I wouldn't necessarily see it as a substitution. Okay. Um, you may have already answered this question a little bit later in the presentation, but there are a couple questions about, you know, how to record time spent seeding different crops in the greenhouse. Um, for example, um, this person spends lots of time seeding onions versus lettuce. So um, this time can be factored individually by crop, right? Um, is this greenhouse starting for transplants? Let's see. Or is it? Oh, who has house? Um, where they're let's say your sound has suddenly um, started echoing, so I'm not sure um, whether your headset is plugged in there. Um, I don't know. Um, can you try it? Okay. Okay, try it again. <laughs> is that any better? No, it's echoing. I think one of the other computers needs to be muted. Maybe the other one um, is... Let's see if we can do that. Um, I'll mute Rebecca's computer because um, you're both working out of errands. Okay, great. Is that better? Okay. Now? Yes, much better. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, my question back was: uh, it, Are these crops being started as transplants, the the onions, or was this being sown directly into like a, a high tunnel, and they'd be harvested right out of, out of the ground of the high tunnel? Okay, that it doesn't say right here, but it seems like okay. in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. So if it's um, for a transplant, then no, right now the way that the spreadsheet is set up is that the, the any labor spent in the greenhouse producing transplants is not tracked 
uh, by crop. That is just an overall value that we're tracking. If this is um, in a greenhouse that you're actually growing in the ground and you're harvesting out of it, then you would track that, that labor spent in there as um, crop specific, that would be field growing for transplanting or weeding or something like that. You would treat it as any norm, normal field crop. Okay. Um, so how are production labor costs differentiated from harvest costs, for example? How are redundancies avoided? Uh, well, production labor costs uh, include harvest, okay. harvest and packing labor, as well as the field growing. So we've kind of uh, broken up the, the way that we're, we're talking about it in the sense that production labor in that first um, spreadsheet page is where you would put all of your um, paid labor amounts, whatever your payroll was, for people who were actually in the field harvesting, producing the crop. Um, all of that labor gets put in that column, whereas any sort of administrative tasks or the selling or um, driving, that type of stuff, would be probably more in your your either admin, so your general management column, which was all the way over to the left, or in one of your market channels, because that, that is a, a, a market channel expense as well, so it's the person standing at farmer's market. So labor um, gets distributed in, over the farm business in different ways. But production labor is what we consider everything that is more field driven in terms of actually producing that crop. So those activities that you associate with greenhouse, field growing, and harvest and packing. Okay. Um, for new farmers that do not actually have an idea of their actual costs, do you have some industry average costs so that um, people could estimate some margin? You know, I don't off the top of my head. Um, but there are some resources that could help a brand new grower get a basic outline of what they can expect to, to spend in certain areas. And, there, and I can put them, um, I can send them to you or I can put them up on the Veggie Compass website, um, but I, I won't be able to recall them right now. There are ones that I've referred to before for this exact purpose as a, as a beginning grower. Okay. Um, can some of the market channels be removed if you don't use them to make the sheet smaller and easier to read? I don't think in the locked version that it's available online that you can do that. I think you would just have to ignore them because of the limitations with Excel. Um, but if you can hide cells, even when it's locked, I would go ahead and hide those columns that you don't need to be looking at. But it's possible um, that within the locked state that it's in when it's available to other people that it's, it's, that you can't do that. Okay. Um, some small farms don't have a greenhouse and pay for others to start seeds for them. So where would you account for this in Veggie Compass? That would be on your first page within uh, that greenhouse expense, but you just wouldn't have labor associated you know, with that. So you would just leave those areas blank, but you account for it in, in that first page of expenses. So that would be an expense within that category. Um, it just wouldn't necessarily be as high as people who are also uh, potentially paying someone else. It would, you would have to see how that, you know, obviously figures out if it makes more sense for you to, to pay someone to do it or to, uh, to do it yourself. Okay. Um, is it possible to access the data anywhere that your team has accumulated from the various farms over the years for labor planning, budgeting, et cetera? Well, the, the data that we have collected has been the labor hour totals. And uh, currently, we're still collecting that. We're getting in the 2011 um, season data entered. And so it's not all up yet. But once we've completed our labor data collection effort, um, we'll have that available in the publication and we'll probably post it to the website as well. But currently, it's, it's still in the compilation state. Okay, we have a couple of questions about the time that it takes to enter this data, um, whether, for example, um, this is factored into the um, farm profits and also whether you have any measurement of the average time that it takes people to enter the data for different size operations. 
I don't know exactly how much time the farms that have been using the spreadsheet are, are spending on filling out the spreadsheet. Um, it is a commitment, that's for sure. Uh, all of this is keeping track of your sales by market channel and by crop, as well as then putting it all together in the spreadsheet. It, it certainly is a time commitment. and. Um, our hope is that for farms that follow through with it, that the results that they're seeing is well worth the time that they've invested in it. And so far, that's the feedback we have been getting, is that people are just learning more and more about their business and, and surprised by some things as well. Um, for instance, someone was considering a grower recently um, expanding their, their production of winter squash. And after filling out the, the veggie compass, spreadsheet and working, you know, co collecting all of the, that labor during the growing season was surprised to find that a winter squash really wasn't a very uh, profitable area for her. And so that wasn't an area that she decided she was going to expand production in. So I think it depends on the farm um, and, and it depends on, you know, how committed you can be to it. But I think that it can have a a pretty profound impact for many growers. It is in a commitment, though. Yeah. Um, another question about the software. Have you tested the spreadsheet on Open Office, or is it only Excel specific? It is just Excel specific right now, yes. OK. So. Um, let's see. Um, based on your website, grower labor associated with filling out the form, okay, has not been completed. Can you tell us, okay, this is the same question. Um, can you tell us what was budgeted for their participation in the project, um, grant supported or in-kind labor? I'm sorry, ask the question again. Okay, based on your website, grower labor associated with filling out the forms has not yet been compiled, but can you tell us what was budgeted for their participation in the project? Um, was it grant supported or was it in-kind labor? Um, you mean like what type of um, reimbursement we gave to growers participating in the project? That's what it seems like the question It sounds like. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, that has changed over the years of the different grants. Um, it's not uh, an enormous amount, but it, I think it's been, ar been around $200 that growers who've participated in the project have been um, two to four hundred have been awarded um, at the end of the season as you know, compensation. But yes, exactly. So Aaron's reminding me, we, we do do uh, all their data entry. So at the end of the season, they fill out all of these forms and mail them to me. And we enter them all into a very large database and then are able to give them a report at the end of the season for them um, that gives them all their total so they don't have to do all that tallying up themselves, which is really the, the real hard part. Um, in all of this is capturing that labor. So even though the, the monetary uh, reward isn't very high, they're, they're getting a lot of labor done for them in terms of compiling their data. OK. Um, for a small family farm, what figure would you suggest to use for salary for um, employees per person? I, I don't have a suggestion for that. I think that that's um, <laughs> something that each farm is, is going to be it's going to be very different. There is a study out by John Hendrickson, who was on our research team, who looked at uh, what uh, pay rate was on a variety of different farms. And it varied um, from close to $3 an hour to close to $14 an hour, um, just depending on the type of farm and how large it was, its level of mechanization. So it's really hard to, to give people uh, a suggested amount that they should budget for their salary. OK. Um, we grow one crop and sell, pack, sell and package it two or three different ways. Um, would you enter that crop as three different line items on the crop sales input page and on the labor long form as well? Or how would you handle that? Um, if you need to track that crop um, separately because you're, you're doing it in different units, so like when you're choosing the crop that you're going to be selling, and, and let's say um, it's spinach, and you do it bulk, but you also do it um, in half pound bags, and you do a lot of it, and you want to track the difference, you can treat them as two different crops. So I would enter them separately if you need to follow them separately in their units. So yes, I would fill them out separately that way. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's a question. Some of the spreadsheet cells are password protected. Do we have to purchase Veggie Compass to unlock it? And if so, what is the cost? No, there is no cost. It is free. Um, some of the cells are, are not customizable, and those are the ones that are locked and protected um, so that people aren't by accidentally um, changing the calculations that are behind the spreadsheet. So everything that's now, the one that is up on the, we on the website should have the cells that people are supposed to be entering data into open and unlocked for them to do that. So if you're clicking on something and it's not allowing you to um, enter something there, I would download the user manual that's also available on the website right next to the, to the link to get the spreadsheet and read through that because it's going to explain to you exactly what is customizable and what isn't and where you should be entering your data and that will help I think users use it. If there is a problem and you know that this is a cell you should be able to enter data into but it is um, still saying it's password protected, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll look into it. Okay, here's a comment from the person who asked the question about open office. He says it's experiment he's experimenting with it now and it seems like it works okay in oh, open great. office. So Well he should certainly email me and let me know where he gets with that because I would be interested in learning more about it too. Um, let's see. Um, can this be used to predict margins or is it entirely retrospective? Well, I think once you have a first year's data in there, it can be used to, to make predictions um, if you're to increase uh, the amount you're growing, so you're going to be increasing sales. Um, so it really depends on how you end up using it, but I think it helps to have a first year's data in there so you can get a benchmark of where you are. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, if I'm using QuickBooks and Veggie Compass, how can I avoid entering the same data twice? Some things, there, I think there's a way that you can um, copy and paste maybe some of your chart of accounts. Um, is, is one way that potentially you could do it. I'm not exactly sure. You might have to paste it into an Excel document and then go and paste it into the open areas of the chart of accounts for like page one. Um, but I don't think there is any easy way in terms of exporting your QuickBooks data directly over into the to the Excel Veggie Compass spreadsheet. It is something that you would just have to re-enter. Okay. It looks like there's some people experimenting with Google Docs as well. Um, someone yes, yes. commented that uh, it accepted it as an upload, but uh, they haven't yet experimented with the formulas um, and the number flow from sheet to sheet, but she thinks it might be easier than we think. So um, you might be interested in hearing about that as well. I would, I would like to, definitely, if people are doing that, I would like to hear. Okay. Um, here's a question about um, on a CI CSA box list form, what is the lot number for? Oh, some farms uh, are keeping track of what fields their crops are coming out of um, for different, you know, it's for traceability basically. So that's what the lot number refers to. Okay, and here's a comment about the, I guess, the labor costs for owner. Three to fourteen dollars per hour for the owner. Was this done in 1978? <laughs> Uh, no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was done a few years ago, but uh, but I think that just goes to show the variability on types of farms and whether you have skilled labor or unskilled labor, um, and you know just what your your management structure is like. It really can have a very different. Okay, here's a question about um, whether you have farmer ranking feedback yet. I'm not sure feedback. what that means. Um, you can clarify um, if you like. Yeah, I mean, I can say feedback. that. Yeah, that we have um, have worked with a few farms that are are using the spreadsheet, and um, they give us feedback a lot, and that's why we've changed the spreadsheet so many times. Um, there's some things that are in order to make it, you know, usable for the masses. It had to be less customizable for the individual, and so that's what's available right now online. Um, mm -hmm. But the feedback that we've gotten from the beta test farms uh, has has been, you know, encouraging. Clearly, they wouldn't be it, it, they wouldn't be doing it if they weren't interested in it. So already, they're a type of farm that's interested in keeping track of this type of data and then uh, finding out the information it can provide. 
Um, let's see, here's a comment again about the labor rate. Um, on dairy farms in our area, the typical labor rate is $7.50 to $12.50, depending on experience. So I think that can really vary. Um, yeah, sure. Let's see, if, if there's, is there a way to enter year-to-year um, -year variables, um, for example, droughts, rainfall amounts, insect damage, or other notes or observations from the field? Not into the spreadsheet, no, but I think that that's knowledge that the farmer knows when they look at this from year to year. Some years there's uh, drought and some years there's crop failure and not. So that's the knowledge the farmer carries with him or herself, you know, from year to year using the spreadsheet. Okay. Um, I'm just looking back. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to type them in. I think we've answered most of them at this point. Oh yeah, um, we had one more question about whether, um, about the password locking of um, certain cells, whether mm -hmm. um, it might, you might release a copy with unlocked formula cells. Um, I could, uh, that person should probably email me. I'm, resist, I'm reluctant to put that up on the website unlocked just because I don't want it to, um, to, to become, you know, very difficult for someone to use in terms of getting the different calculations deleted. Um, but if that person is, is interested in tweaking the spreadsheet in a specific way for themselves and would like an unlocked version of it, I can do that. They should just email me. Okay. Well, we have um, more feedback from the person who exported it into Google Docs, and she says it works in Google Docs. So okay. um, you may want to contact Rebecca about that. Um, maybe try it a little bit more and see what happens. Well, um, I'd like to thank everybody for their questions. And as I mentioned before, if you have additional questions about Veggie Compass, um, feel free to contact Rebecca. She's generally generously provided her um, contact information right there. And um, if you have other um, general questions about organic farming, um, please feel free to use the Ask an Expert service at eExtension, and the link for that is on your screen at um, extension.org slash ask. And um, you can find this presentation within the coming week um, as a recording as well as a PDF handout of the slides. And you can also register for our many upcoming webinars on organic farming topics and view our archived eOrganic webinar recordings at the link on your screen. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and presenting today, Erin and Rebecca, and thank, thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you.